Hello friends, Heidi here from Rain Country. God is good all the time. And I'm here today for another Monday this and that vlog where I talk about all kinds of different topics, either leading you back to old videos I have, answering questions that are coming in, sharing with you some updates and letting you know of things yet to come. So let's get to the topics of today. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the green tomato zucchini relish. So I just bringing this up because I already have a video I did like probably 2017, I think was when I did that video. And I haven't put up any more relish since because we just don't go through it enough until I started using it to add to my potato salads. <laughs> However, since I was starting to run a little bit low, I decided I should put some up. And now that I've got a lot of tomatoes already put up, then green tomato and zucchini relish is what I decided to do because uh, zucchini is another thing we tend to get a lot of, though not this year. We didn't get a ton of zucchini this year, despite all the plants I had, but I got enough to put up more than what I had hoped for. So I'm bringing this up so that if you haven't done it yet and you do like relish, this is a great recipe to give a try. But I wanted to let you know of a couple things before you go check out that video. And one is, in that video, I was using white vinegar because I was concerned about my homemade vinegar not being strong enough. As long as it reads as a pH of uh, 3.0 or lower, it's going to be good enough, especially when you're working with something like green tomatoes, which is are pretty acidic anyway. And so I used homemade vinegar in this recipe. And the other thing I did, you guys are going to be happy, is I actually took time to type the recipe up and then went and put it under that video link so that not only will you have the video to, to go by, you can also have the written instructions. But I do still recommend you watch the video so you can just kind of see how I did things there. And by the way, for that silly person that looked at the picture I posted in the community section, these are not genetically modified tomatoes. This is actually, I believe this one is a black brandy wine, and it is very unripe. So <laughs> somebody saw that picture, oh, be careful, those are genetically modified. No, they're not. All the seeds I got were originally from heirloom, non-GMO seeds, or even like with the purple ones uh, from the tomato I saved years ago. And I just keep growing them every year, saving the seeds every year and growing them again. They are organic, heirloom, and non-GMO. Believe me. I don't know how people can just look at a picture of a green tomato and say, oh, that's genetically modified and make a really dumb assumption. Anyway, speaking of tomatoes and putting them up, this jar back here, I have a lot, I have a lot of jars right now put up of red tomato flakes and they're beautiful. However, there's been some weird anomaly that's been happening to people all over the place this year. It's never happened to me before. And I've been getting emails of this happening to other people. And here I thought the mistake was on my end. So I had a couple of batches of tomato that I dried up that ended up turning black. At first I thought, oh, did I have the heat too high? Did I run them too long? I just, it didn't make sense to me. And I do know that that first batch, I had tried them on the brown trays, the brown silicone trays that I had never used before. And I was thinking like, maybe it's that. So I did the next batch on the green trays, same thing happened. Then I was worried, is it my cassori? Maybe it's breaking down after only a year, and maybe it's just heating things too hot despite the setting I put it on. Nope, it wasn't that, because then a couple days later, I was able to do it again without any issue. Both the green and the brown silicone sheets, same dehydrator, and they turned out fine. And by the way, I did taste them, and they didn't taste burnt. They actually, the flavor is a little different. It actually has a more tart flavor than the, uh, than the ones that didn't turn black, but still taste like tomatoes and do not taste burnt. So I tried when, the, when I did that, when I was making the uh, gluten-free ravioli that time and I made the sauce for it, I did try putting a pinch of the black uh, flakes in there and it seemed like it just kind of added a richer flavor to it. It did, of course, turn the sauce much darker as you can see in this image, but, uh, and that was just adding a little bit, but it was still quite good. 
So what I what I decided to do is take all the black ones and put them in a separate jar by themselves and just use them a little bit at a time. I might even, just for the heck of it, try just making a black tomato sauce and see how that turns out. But yeah, they're not burnt, they're not spoiled, so I don't really understand what happened there. The only hypothesis I have on this, and when I got to thinking about it, is that the ones that, the bounces that turned black were the ones that happened during the heat wave that we had in, uh, what was it, uh, early August, I think it was, or late July. And it got abnormally hot for our area. Because we live in a wet climate, when it gets hot like that, it gets very humid. And so I wonder if the humidity was part of the problem. So I'm curious, for those of you who had tomatoes that turned black on you when you were dehydrating them, do you live in a humid climate? Were, was it during a time when it was the hottest weather and that you were drying them and this happened? It, it's just the only connection I can make because nothing else panned out. It wasn't the brown silicone trays. It wasn't my Cassori. It's still working great like it should. Oh, and it also happened when I was drying them on my Nesco. That was the other time. So it wasn't it wasn't the Quasori because it was happening on both dehydrators no matter where I was dehydrating it. So when I was dehydrating them in the other room on the Quasori, what I started doing was turning on a couple of fans so that the air was circulating really well in the room. And especially one of the bigger box fans I had pointed towards the dehydrator uh, maybe to, to just kind of help carry the moisture and the warmer air away from the dehydrator and keep things circulating. Now, it could be coincidence, but that did seem to solve the problem. Anyway, I'm really not sure. I, I, I can't say with any certainty that had anything to do with it, but it's the only thing I've, I've been able to correlate so far. I, it just, anyway, it's been bizarre. So, but yes, thankfully, most of my tomatoes turned out like they should have, like in this picture here. That's how they look, and they're great. So, mostly it's just the color. You know, the flavor's fine. Okay, so moving on from there, let's talk a little bit about some other dehydrating projects. I've got, I'm starting to dehydrate up my um, Chinese five color peppers. You can see there's some few different colors in there. Once I get that jar filled up, I'm going to go ahead and then powder them up. And I've been dehydrating carrots, so I got a real good harvest of carrots this year. Best harvest yet, and I still have carrots out there. And here's a picture of one of my harvests, just one of them. So I decided to go ahead and, and try dehydrating some. I love it. I actually like them better than the home canned carrots. And I just wanted to try it because I, I don't want, I decided I didn't want to do any more canning this year other than the relish and some jams because of my pantry space is getting more and more limited. So I've been dehydrating green beans as well instead of canning them like I normally would. And then here's the big jar of carrots. So I did some to start with and then decided I'd try cooking them up. I did this with both the beans and the carrots and I just put them in some hot water, boiled them for about 10, 15 minutes. And well, and I liked them both. I thought they were both good. I mean, neither one plump up quite as big as they are before you put them on your dehydrator. But what I like, especially about the carrots, is they held their flavor. They taste more like a homegrown, fresh carrot than the canned carrots I have or any dried carrots I bought or anything like that. So I'm very pleased. And they have more, they have a better texture to them if you don't like the more mushy, texture of canned carrots. I don't mind it, but these do, when you cook them up, they do just hold some texture. They still get soft enough to eat where there's no crunch, but they just they just have a texture to them. They're not mush. Uh, and the beans, I would say the same thing. I don't think canned beans have a texture of mush, but I do, you know, generally speaking, I think just to eat them as a side dish, I'd prefer the canned ones over the dried ones, but the dried ones are still good. They would be, they're something that would be really great for throwing into soups, stews, or even a roast, like putting them in with the roast along with carrots and potatoes and let everything cook together so the juices from the roast will um, cook the beans. And I, I haven't tried that yet, but I am going to do that the next time I cook up a roast. And 
I think that would be really good because you get the flavors in there and then it would be cooking for a long time. And so I think that would make them turn out really good. So that is my plan with those. And then as you know, I've talked about in last week's video, the dehydrating potatoes. Here's just a few more potatoes I've dug up since. I'm still not done digging up potatoes, but I wanted to show you these. So these all came from the areas that had the most uh, protection from the cold. This is just a few of them. <laughs> There's, I got a bunch more over here. They're just sitting out here curing. And I don't want to dehydrate them all up. I already have 17 quart jars of potatoes. I have the sliced ones here and I have the diced up ones. But I don't want to do them all that way. I want to keep as many as I can like this, but too many. And if we can't work through them fast enough, even in the coldest room in the house, even stored in straw, that does help a lot. I still end up having a lot that will shrivel up. And I don't have any of that rot. As long as I let them dry thoroughly and have the straw or whatever in there to keep them all separated and plenty of airflow, I haven't had any, I don't have any of that rot or it's very rare but they still end up shriveling up and get re getting really soft. And I, I don't like it when they do that. So I want to try to put as many up as I can. And yes, I know you can leave them in the ground. I've been growing potatoes for many years, but there's a few things I've learned through experience. Is one is when you live in a place that gets 120 inches of rain annually, and most of that happens during the winter time, leaving potatoes in the ground uh, the ones that stay on the ground, they might be good for growing a new potato, but they're, uh, they don't stay good. They're more likely to rot because they're constantly just soaked and saturated. And then also, those are the same areas I allow the chickens to free range during the late fall through winter. So if they find a potato and dig it up, they'll eat it. So, I mean, and that's fine. At least it's more food for the chickens. But obviously, if I leave all my good potatoes out there, they're going to eat all my potatoes and I'm not going to have any for us. If you live in the right climate and, and you're not living in a small place where you let your chickens uh, free range in your garden areas, yeah, most of the time you can leave potatoes in the ground and just harvest them as you need it. And also, by the way, harvesting potatoes out of a soggy, wet ground during when it's rainy, no, not not fun, not fun at all. And they're much dirtier coming out of the ground, so there's a lot more to clean up. Oh, and by the way, I, I'll have a video coming out on growing potato uh, carrots, and I'm also gonna be shooting a video today, but it'll be five or six weeks before it publishes uh, on how we how I grow my potatoes. So, the, and this is just what we do, what works for us, because uh, people are like, well, how do you do it? You know, because they wanna know how we get so such big potatoes. It's just, we just do it. Anyway, I'll be shooting that video so you can watch for that so you can be ready for next year. All right, the next thing I want to talk about is Heidi from Ditch Drugstore has been contacting me and we've been communicating back and forth. And she does online herbal classes for those who are interested. Now, she's offered to give me a commission and all that, but I'm tur I've turned it down because... I just don't have time to take the class myself and to look through all of her information, but I did check out her website and talking back and forth with her and knowing that Mary's Nest and a couple other people that well-known people have been, you know, have taken her course and have been really pleased with it. And also knowing her background and that she's coming at it from a standpoint of a, as a believer like myself, I, I'm going to go ahead and recommend it because I think I did watch a couple of her videos that I was able to look at and I I just think she's got a really good presence and if you really are interested in taking an online herbal course I believe that's going to be a great way to go and she's even offered a coupon code for all of my followers for anyone who wants to sign up for 10% off. I'll be putting all the appropriate links in the description box down below along with that coupon code Rain Country 10 is what you'll put in there. But she also just informed me this morning that she does have a free course that you can take. So it's going to, it's a far more brief. It just covers five different herbs. And I will provide the link to that as well for those who can't afford to take a full class like that, which, you know, I totally understand. Just so you know, I am earning nothing off of this. I'm just recommending it based on the uh, information I have received from Heidi 
and the interactions I've had back and forth with her. And then also knowing that Mary's Nest, she was a part of that and she recommends it. I, you know, I think those are that's a pretty good thing to go by there. Even though I've chosen not to earn any commission, you can still get that 10% off if you choose to go that route or at least check out her free option that she has there. All right, one more thing before I close out this video, I wanted to say, I want to remind everyone, because I know there's a lot of new people coming in, and um, I'm already a little too spread out on social media than I'd like to be, but I do have, you can find me, Rain Country Homestead, on Instagram, Rain Country on Freesteading, Rain Country Homestead on Rumble, and Rain Country Homestead on BitChute, even though I've only got two videos out there, because I'm still confused about that place. Don't have a lot of time to learn about it, but regardless oh on patreon it doesn't matter what site you go to if you need to send me a private message please use none of those none of those and even though uh my store is basically closed my presence is still there on etsy don't message me there either because the chances of me seeing your messages are incredibly slim same thing with facebook i never see those messages ever and sometimes i'll stumble across messages like when i go into patreon to put a, up a post in there which by the way is free to everyone i don't charge for any of my information over there but then people will message me through there and i might stumble across it weeks later because i haven't made a post in a while that might be the only time i see your message so if you need to get a hold of me and you've got important questions that you want to make sure I get it because even comments, I'm not going to see them all because I have so many more comments coming in all the time. And especially since I've set aside a day during the week, Saturday is my day that I stay away from YouTube. And because I have to have some downtime, I have to have that time if I want to hang on to my sanity. And that means though a lot of comments tend to pile up on Saturdays and I, can, I just cannot get to them all. And same thing goes with email. Email, I'm not going to I don't answer my emails on Saturdays either, but at least I'm more likely to see those than I would in comments in YouTube or on certainly more likely than any private messages you send me in any other place. It doesn't matter what it is. Email raincountryhomestead at gmail.com. And please, I prefer you send it as an email to my email, not as a text from your phone. If you got to use your phone, please make sure to send it from your email address, or at the very least, make sure you add your email so I can reply to it. Because if I try to reply directly to a text message that was sent to my email, chances of you getting it are incredibly slim. Incredibly slim, and then you'll think I'm ignoring you. So it's preferably you use an email app and email me that way, or your computer, send it as an email, not as a text message. Just so you know, a lot of times when those of you who send e uh, messages to my email as a text message, well, all that shows up for me is a phone number. There's no name and there's no email address for me to reply to. And your message comes in the form of an attachment. So that it just makes it, it, it just makes it that much more time consuming for me to deal with that when I've got a lot of emails I gotta go through, especially on a Sunday morning. All right, well, I hope you enjoyed my video for the week. Anything you'd like to add, questions you have, please put them in comments down below. And thanks for watching. Take care and God bless.